1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. I appreciate you all being here today. We're looking at a subject in the next three more weeks on continuing, which is the theme of this coming year, that I want to be thinking of this word continue. And today we're looking at the subject of continuing in sound doctrine. I mentioned last week, and I think it's important that Americans, Christianity in America has capsulized Christianity and put it into little cubby holes. It is as if the world is too important for us to make our life all about Christianity, so we have to have other parts in our life and other portions of our life that are directed to other things besides Christianity. And so we have to find some place to put our beliefs. But when we need them, we need to be able to get at them and bring them out. In case we need to share them with someone, we have to dust them off. We need to talk about them and we, we, we need to show people that this is something we really believe. But when we're done, then we can fold them back up again and we can put them away until the next time we need them. And there's so many other parts of this world besides just Christian doctrine. And so our Christian life has become, in periods of time, little capsules of time, where we spend one hour a week in church, or an hour and a half a week in church, and coming here, sitting, being able to take those things out of those cubby holes, and talk about them with other people who also take them from their cubby holes. And then we have our 15-minute devotions, and then we don't want to forget the two minutes of prayer before each meal, and then probably about four or five minutes where we may read a Bible verse and pray before we go to sleep at night. And so we have these time segments that are very important, and as long as we keep all of these time segments, then we feel that God is going to bless us. And it's like Christianity is this talisman that we rub a little bit on the Bible and, and get it a and of course, when we put the Bible on the end table, make sure it's right side up and make sure it's not having anything on top of it, making sure the Bible's on top of everything else because it's important. And so we set it there because it's important to us and it becomes some kind of a good luck charm that we use so that God will bless us. We forget that the Bible is not about periods of time. It's about continuing. It, we talked about last week about John chapter 15. And you don't have to turn there now, but John 15, it just says this. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. He says in verse 7, If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it will be done unto you. Here is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. And I write here on the sheet a big if, if ye abide in me, if my words abide in you. And again, that word abide does not mean to visit once a week for an hour. It means to continue. It means to be a part of your life. It means to be a part of your being, that this Bible becomes who you are. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, we read these words in verse 16. It says, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, I read these words for you. It says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast heard or hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. If you take your Bible, please, and turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. I mentioned last week that one of the interesting things about the Bible is it was written in Greek. The New Testament, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and some Aramaic. But the New Testament was written in, in Greek. And Greek is a very precise language. I'm glad he chose that language for the New Testament. For one reason, it was known throughout the entire world, and so it was a, a vehicle that could be used to preach the gospel in many, many places. But also, this Greek has a present tense that is continuous action. 
In the Greek language, not always, but most of the time, when you speak in present tense, you are talking about continuous action. In verse 7 of Matthew 7, it says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. And really, it is present tense, so keep on asking, it will be given you. Keep on seeking, you will find. And keep on knocking, and it shall be opened unto you. Some illustrations of that, please. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10 in the Old Testament. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, one of the major prophets. And we're looking at Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10. The background of this passage is the presidents and the princes in Babylon were jealous of this man. And so when the Medes and Persians, of course, took over and the presidents and princes saw Daniel being elevated to this position of leadership, they wanted to find some reason why they could attack this man. And so they said, the only thing we're going to find against Daniel, he's a very honest, upright man, it'll be in his relationship with his God. So they went to the king and they said, King, we have a law for you. Why don't you pass this law that for 30 days, it's only going to be 30 days, that no man is allowed to ask a petition of any person or any God except for you. And of course that appealed to Cyrus and appealed to this king. And so Cyrus signed this petition and this petition said that for the space of 30, year, or 30 days, no one could ask any petition of any God except for the king. It really elevated the king to a position of deity. And the king didn't realize the ramifications of that, but Daniel, in chapter 6, verse 10, it says this, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Then these men assembled and they found Dan praying and making supplication before his God. Can you imagine how much it could have solved that problem? <laughs> Daniel didn't have to have that problem. For one thing, don't have, you don't have to do it three times a day. <laughs> You don't have to kneel. You can stand up and pray. You can walk around as you pray. You don't even have to close your eyes. You can have your eyes open when you pray. They don't know if you're talking to yourself. They don't know what you're doing. Make it easy on yourself, Daniel. Shut the window. You don't need the window open, Daniel. So here's this guy, Daniel, who's bringing all this problem upon himself because he keeps on praying. He keeps on asking. And it's just like him. He has to get on his knees. He has to shut his eyes, bow his heads, open the window so everyone knows that he's praying. But for Daniel, this petition is critically important. And again, you have to understand that verse 7 again, you read this, all the presidents and kingdom and governors and princes and counselors and captains have consulted together to establish a royal decree and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god. What was Daniel doing? He was petitioning his god. Daniel was asking a request of his god. They were in captivity in a land far from Jerusalem. And Daniel had to pray. It was important to him to pray. The captivity was not God's will for his people. And Daniel wanted to pray that God's will might be accomplished. That they could be back in that land. And he would not stop. Another illustration please. Luke chapter 15 verse 8. Keep on asking. The next one is keep on seeking. Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15 verse 8 is another illustration of a woman who has lost a coin. It says in verse 8, either, that, either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. 
And when she hath found it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which was lost. And then he says, Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. Now you can imagine, if it were you and you or I, if it were if we were the ones that were in charge or in the in the process of the seeking, you'd look under the bed, you'd look in the junk drawer, you'd look on the shelves, you'd look in all of the containers, you'd look on the floor, you'd sweep it, and then you'd give up, right? Not that critical. If your son were to call you and say, Dad, can you look on the internet and see if you can find, for me probably, he would say, find why this code is on my car, why my check engine light is on. Okay, I'll go online. And I look online, and, and I may sp spend an hour or maybe a half hour looking, and it's just not that important. If I don't find the answer for it, I'll just call and say, Matt, I really couldn't find anything on that. You probably could, but I'm just saying for illustration. I didn't, couldn't find anything. But if you came home and you got a phone call that said your son was in the doctor and the doctor said he had a cancer and it was a very, very rare cancer and there was no operation and nothing they could do for it. They couldn't try any chemo. They couldn't try radiation. There was nothing. And he gave you the name of the cancer. Now, I don't know about you, but I think as a parent, what I would do is I would be on that computer and I would look and I would look and I would look and I would look. And the reason my seeking would be much more intense to find every bit of information I could on that cancer was because it's so much more important than finding the code for a car. It's so much more important to me. This woman, when she loses this piece of silver, she does not give up. The whole idea is here is till she find it. She's not going to stop. She looks and she looks and she looks and she looks. Why? Because it is that important to her. You can see a little bit about how important it is because when she finds it, she calls all her friends and her neighbors and she tells them, it's time to rejoice. The last one is knocking. If you look at Luke chapter 11, verse 5, another illustration. In Luke chapter 11, verse 5, he says, And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go to him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine is in his journey, has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I can't arise and give you. Picture the scenario. You know, nowadays we'd say, Why didn't he stop at McDonald's? You know? But in those days, there is no place to eat. And so he's traveling the road, and he obviously gets to his destination later than he expected. He, he doesn't have a watch on, but if he did, he'd be looking and say, man, I can't believe how late it's getting. It's dark out. It's getting dark. we have still got five miles to go, and they keep walking and walking and walking. And finally, they get to the home before midnight. But it's late. They, they come to this home, and, and the man gets up, and he's expecting them. He says, come in. You haven't eaten anything? They're very hungry. They've walked all day long. They're very hungry. And he says, what can I do? I don't have any food. So he runs over to his neighbor and he knocks on his neighbor door. Now this is something like this. John, are you in there? John. Yeah, what do you want? I've got a friend who came. He needs something to eat. Can you get me some loaves of bread? No, go away. John. This guy does not stop. Pretty soon it's like, Pretty soon, it becomes so loud, so intense, and he starts, John! John, open up! And, you know, he's becoming an incredible pest. You can imagine how much of a pest he is. There is no limit to how much of a pest this guy can become. He is such a pest. You're not going to give him three loaves of bread because he's a friend. It does not matter. At this point, 
<laughs> you're going to give them loaves of bread. <laughs> and boy, you also are tempted, aren't you? To send them back with a broken nose or a black eye. Because he's going to get something from this trip. It is easier for you to get him up, I mean, at, from, from your point of view, to get this man up, than to go to the next neighbor and try to wake him up. So the man finally gets up and he gives him his three loaves of bread. And Jesus uses this as an illustration. He says in verse 9, I say unto you, ask, it will be given. Seek, you shall find. And knock, and it will be opened to you. He says in verse 10, for everyone that asks receives. Is that true? Does everybody who asks receive? Well, no. But you miss the point. Because he's not saying one time ask. He says, for everyone who continually asks, who continually seeks, who continually knocks, will receive. And so he has this tremendous importance about this. Now I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And I'm going to once again remind you, when we look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, continuing doctrine, the first point of this outline, it's much like the lady in the, with the coin. You're continuing in doctrine. You're abiding in the doctrine. You're staying here. You're remaining here. Has a lot to do with the value that you place upon it. If this has important value with you, you will remain with the doctrine. If the doctrine is unimportant, you will not remain in the doctrine. It has a lot to do with how important it is for you to understand God's Word. Just how important is it to you? Now I hope I'm not stepping on toes, but a lot of your parents may know what it's like. And you say to your son or your daughter, you say, son, daughter... Have you had your devotions today? And they say, yeah, yeah, I had them. And you said, well, what, what did you learn? Well, I, uh, I read a few verses in, uh, in uh, let me think, I think it was John, uh, John 10. A few verses in John 10. You remember what it was like? Yeah, it was about Jesus being the door. Okay, wonderful. Your heart is sick as a parent. Because you've just seen them and watched them spend hours and hours in front of the TV or in front of the computer. Or it's just sick because you know it just doesn't mean that much to them. It just doesn't mean that much to them. But if you look at this verse, listen to what this verse says. In verse 16, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. This passage is not talking about whether your kids think doctrine is important. This passage is saying, listen, if you want your kids to think doctrine is important, the point is, it had better be important to you. Doctrine will never be important to someone else. It has to be important to me. I have to continue in them. These principles have to become a very important part of my life. If you hold your place, but turn with me to John chapter 8, verse 32. How important it is that you and I see this as being more important than just a casual glimpse. John chapter 8, verse 32. Let me share this with you. There is truth in God's Word, and there's truth in churches, and there's truth in people's lives. But compared to how much false there is, there's countless, almost innumerable, more false doctrine than there is true doctrine. There's almost an innumerable amount of false doctrine out there. There's far more false doctrine than there is true doctrine. The devil tries to seduce by sheer multitude of, of voices. There are far more false prophets than there are true prophets. Far more false speakers and teachers than there are true teachers. 
In John chapter 8, verse 32, the Lord says this, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But it is based upon you knowing the truth. If you know the truth, then the truth will set you free. What does it imply if you do not know the truth? If you do not know the truth, then you will not be set free. Evidently, a lie brings you into bondage. Lies do not cause you to have liberty. Truth does. Now, if you couple that together with John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy word, thy word is truth. Or sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. If you think about that, it is based, again, you look at John chapter 8, Listen, listen to what it says one more time. John 8, 32. And you shall know the truth. Where is the truth found? In the Bible. So my question is, I can tell you how free you are based upon how well you know the Bible. The more you know the Bible, the more free you will be. The less you know the Bible, the less free you will be. You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Well, where do you get the truth from? So my question is, how well do you know the Bible? Because that will determine how free you are in your life. And because of this fact that I'm telling you about, there's so many false voices and false teachers, this truth project tonight is extremely important. Because there are lies out there, many, many, many lies Every single truth of the Bible, every truth has a corresponding lie and multitudes of them. If, if the Bible says man was cr created in the image of God, man was created in the image of God, what does the world say as a lie? Man evolved from a lower creature. That does not set you free. If the Bible says that man has fallen in a sin nature, what does the world say? Well, man is basically good. And every single truth of the Bible has a corresponding lie. But what I'm telling you is, your school teachers... If they do not know Christ as Savior, they will not understand this. They will propagate this. And you'll be hearing lies your entire life. And your entire worldview, as we were looking at that trailer earlier, it would make you cry to think of how many Christians have fallen for this. They do not know the Word of God. The truth does not set them free. If you look back again at first at the second Timothy chapter two verse fifteen. Just real quickly, second Timothy two fifteen, it just says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That is not a one time event. You not say, Well, I did that once. I don't have to do that again. I did that once. I've already studied one portion of the Bible. I already studied a verse. This is something that you do continually your whole life. Now again, back in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, he says, Take heed to thyself and unto the doctrine. Now go back one verse, and I want you to notice this in context. Verse 15, he says, Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly unto them, that thy profiting may appear to all. It is not a one-time segment of time. It's not a one-time event. It is a meditating upon God's Word over and over and over, taking it into your heart, constantly putting it into your mind. The second principle I want to, you to look at is still found in the same verse here, please. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, it says, Take heed to thyself, and under the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. My second point is continue on unto salvation. Carry on to salvation. What it, is, it is not saying this. The verse is not saying that, I don't know if you can read this on the bottom. Yeah, you can't read it very well. It says, it's not saying being saved from hell. 
This is not talking about that you work really hard and you really meditate on these doctrines and you will be saved from hell. The word saved in this passage does not refer to heaven or hell. I want you to understand what it's saying in the context. If you go back to chapter 4, verse 1, please. He says, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You notice on that passage that demons have doctrines. Demons have doctrine. And spirits seduce. What the passage is saying, that the salvation he's talking about, by getting into God's Word and meditating upon it, you will be saved from this deception that he talks about. In the latter days, he wants you to know, and it's very important, the word expressly means concisely or in plain words. These things are really important. He does not want you to miss it. That there's going to be testing, or, I'm sorry, there's going to be a, a false teaching in the last days that will possibly even cause some of you to go astray. I'd like to have you take your Bible, please, and turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, begin with, I want you to look at verse 13. I just want to share this with you by way of an illustration. In verse 13 he says, But he that endured the end, the same shall be saved. That verse, word saved is not talking about heaven or hell either. It's called pigeonhole thinking when we take a, ver a word like the word saved and we automatically think it means being saved from hell. This is, word is not talking about being saved from hell. This one, again, if you look at verse 11, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, but he that endure to the end, the same shall be saved. This is talking about the tribulation period, and it's going to be saved from the deception of the tribulation period. There's going to be a tremendous amount of deception in the tribulation. If you look at verse 24, listen to this carefully. And there shall rise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. As a matter of fact, according to the Bible, the pinnacle of the false teaching of the devil is in the tribulation period. It's called the lie. Many will believe the lie of the devil. If you want to see that, Turn in your Bible to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let me show you what I'm talking about. 2 He says in verse 9, I know it's not on the board. You'll have to find, find it in your, your, your book. This is not part of my notes. I just want to share this with you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. It says, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness, catch that word, of unrighteousness, in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe literally the lie. God will allow them to be deluded in the tribulation period. The tribulation will be extremely huge with deception, filled with deception, and the people in the tribulation people it will be deceived. Now, having said that, we are living in the end of the, of the, the church age. The Spirit speaks expressly in, that in the latter times. We are just a short time from the tribulation period to the pinnacle of the deception. The devil is very busy now in the church age giving deception. It hasn't reached its pinnacle, but I'm telling you it's very close to the top. We're living in a time period where there's a tremendous amount of deception out there. And people will believe that lie in just a short time. The Antichrist will give you that lie and people will accept it. And there's all kinds of deceivableness in the tribulation period. The devil 
actually gives power to a man called the false prophet to cause a statue of the beast to come alive. A statue will come to life in the tribulation period. That's how difficult that time period is going to be. And it could deceive even the very elect if they were here. Now, take your Bible and turn with me to the third point, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. How do you save yourself from that false teaching, that deception? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. We read this. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And my point then is consider the source. Take your Bible, please, and turn with me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Consider the source. How do you know if these people are true prophets or if they are false prophets? On the board here, I share this with you in Matthew 7, 16. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Verse 20 of chapter 7. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Because the Bible says the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. A person who is unsaved without the Holy Spirit cannot produce the fruit of the Spirit. He can't do it. In John chapter 15, I want you to notice verse 16, please. We'll start reading in verse 15, John 15. It says, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knows not what his Lord does. But I've called you friends, for all things have I heard of my Father I've made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I've chosen you, and I've ordained you that you should go forth and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, abide, continue. That whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, that you love one another. There are two things that are really important in you determining whether something is true or not. Consider the source. Number one, look to see if they have fruit of holiness in their life. See if they have fruit of holiness in their life. Now, it is true that there is so much deception in this world today that a person could put on a front of holiness. But it's only a front. Therefore, the second principle is See if the fruit remains. It must continue to be genuine fruit. So you look to see if the fruit that they have in their life is fruit of holiness, and then you look to see if that fruit remains. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. You have a man who's very, very, very wise. You consider him a very wise man, and he comes up to you and he gives you a teaching that you've never heard before. It's something that you've never, ever heard. Well, the first principle here, I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. We're almost done with this lesson today. But look at Isaiah 8, 20 to begin with. We'll start reading in verse 19, please. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter. Should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead, to the law and to the testimony? If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Friends, some of the biggest problems we're having today is Christian books. Now, there are a lot of good Christian books out there, but there are so many deceiving books on the market today that have so much deception in them. And every once in a while, they'll quote a verse from the Bible. And you've got to be so careful. One of the most dangerous times, I think, in the church right now is the movement of Christian secular counselors that have integrated secular counseling with Christian teaching. 
These men who, who won't even claim to be theologians, who do not even claim to know the Bible well, integrating Christian teaching and secular teaching into supposedly Christian counseling. I think there are so many dangerous subjects that they're approaching right now. I really believe that you are in a problem. In Psalm 1-1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. And there are many Christians right now that are seeking help. And they want help so badly that they will find any source of help. And they will go to secular counselors to try to get help. And the Bible says, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. If you want to find true wisdom, number one, it better be based upon the Word of God. Number two, if you would take your Bible, please, and turn to the book of James chapter 3 verse 17 I believe the answers are found in the Bible I believe this is a source that God has given us for strength for help for truth I believe the Bible is the source of truth if they speak not according to this word it is because there's no light in them John chapter 3 verse 17 or I mean James chapter 3 verse 17 Let's start reading at verse 15. Here's a wise man. I'm saying this. Verse 15. This wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there's confusion in every evil work. Here's the earmark of true wisdom. Verse 17. But the wisdom that's from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy, good fruits. Notice the word good fruits. Without partiality, without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. You look to see if the wisdom is accompanied by fruit of godliness and holiness. And then, of course, the last thing that I mentioned to you, you find the tree, it's full of rotten fruit. You have to see that the fruit remains. The fruit continues. It does not go away. It's not a one-day process. Oh, they, they seem very nice. They were very kind. They even prayed before they, they taught, taught us. You see if the fruit will remain and will continue. Now, that was a lot to talk about in a shorter period of time. Christianity is not about visiting the Bible once a week. It's not about you opening your Bible and then putting it away for a week in a cubbyhole. Christianity must remain. We must study to show ourselves approved unto God. I'm telling you, the reason why churches have so little power today is because people have such a small amount of God's Word within them. They know such a little bit about God's Word. And they go to church every week, every week, every week. We were raised in a mainline church. My dad and mom sent us to church and then we would walk home after Sunday school. My mom had a big white Bible, big family Bible on the coffee table. And in the Bible she had written some of the names of some of their relatives. I never saw my dad pick up a Bible. In all the, age, in all the time I was growing up until I became a Christian at the age of 12. But one day, my dad changed completely. And God got a hold of my dad's heart. And my dad began to read the Bible, and he never put it down. He would study it, and he would study it, and he would study it, and he would study it. He en enrolled in a correspondence course from Lynchburg, Virginia. And he read it, and he studied it, and he studied it, and his Bible began to be marked with writing on every page, fingerprint marks on every page. The bindings were falling apart. And my dad began to study that book. That change in my dad's life had a huge impact on our family. I would have to say that my oldest brother really never saw that. He was already too old for that. So he really never saw that change that took place. 
He never saw my dad preach a message. But my oldest brother, my second oldest brother became a pastor. I became a pastor. My younger brother became a pastor. My youngest brother is started a church in Florida in his own home, and he's still preaching in that church. It made a huge difference in our family, in our life, because my dad began to take this Bible, and he began to not only read it, began to apply it. It is not how much you get into the Bible, but it's how much the Bible gets into you. A lot of people in the church who get into the Bible We've got to get this Bible into us, into me. The Bible has to change me from the inside out. It cannot change me from the outside in. It is not some good luck charm that I hold on to. It's not some good luck charm that I put on my end table. The Bible is made and built from God so we would meditate on it. So it would save us from deception. So we would understand to continue in this doctrine, continue in this truth. I'm really encouraging you to come back tonight for the Truth Project. One of the purpose of this message is to encourage you tonight to come back. Because it is so important for you to learn and understand the truths of the Word of God. I'd like to have every head bowed and every eye closed, please. As we close this time today, I want to ask you quickly, do you know for certain if you were to die that you'd go to heaven? Do you know that Jesus Christ is the one who died on the cross for your sins? Are you certain, are you 100% certain that you are saved? Jesus Christ died on the cross to give you a gift of eternal life. You're not saved because you deserve it or because you earn it or because you're so good. You're not saved because you're in church. You're not saved because you're baptized. You're only saved by accepting the free gift of God, which is eternal life. If you've never done that, you need to do that today. He that believeth on me, Jesus said, hath everlasting life. And friends, this is a good starting point in this year for us to continue. I can tell you one place where we have to continue. It's in the Word of God. We have to continue in the Word of God. The Word of God has to become not only a part of us, it has to become our whole being. The reason that we live, the reason we, we breathe is because of the truth. It sets us free. Let's bow in prayer. Father, I thank you very much for those that are here today. If anyone needs to make a decision for you, Father, help them to make that decision where they sit right now or later where they stand. I would love to have them come to me and tell me about that decision, but Father, May you bless your word today, that it would be your, for, for your glory that we would continue in your word, continue in the doctrine, that these things would become vital to us. The way we ask, the way we seek, the way we knock would be based upon how much value we place in this book. And once again, Father, we ask your blessing upon each one here. In your name we pray, amen.
Thank you for tuning into our broadcast today. We hope it was a blessing to you. You know, the greatest need that we have in our life is to come to know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Churchianity is not Christianity. Just because you go to church, just because you're baptized, does not mean you know Christ the Savior. You see, the Bible makes it very clear that we have to be perfect to get to heaven. And no matter how many good things you do, you can never become perfect. And that's why the Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth and He died upon the cross to pay for your sin. When He took your sin, He also gave you His righteousness. The Bible says that He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that's why the Bible also says, For God made Him Christ to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, this would be a great time for you to put your trust in Christ by receiving His free gift, by putting your trust in Him, the one who died on the cross for you. If there's anything we can do to help you, please give us a call. We'd love to help you come to know Christ, to know Him better, and also make Him known to others. You know, if you love Christ, you also love His body. And of course, His body is the church. And so if you don't have a church that you attend, we invite you to come and visit us at Calvary Baptist Church this week. Our service times are 9.30 and 10.30 for our worship service, and Sunday night at 6 o'clock. We'd enjoy seeing you this Sunday.